created by God that has space for two types of humans, male and female, and implies perhaps since together they are somehow the image of God, implies some sort of complementarity between the two. In the very next verse, we're told that God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. So now two types of humans who are complementary express, express that complementarity through reproduction. In chapter 2, verses 23 to 24, first we have the man speaking to that complementarity in terms of bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, this one taken out of the man and called woman, and we're told that this is the reason why a man leaves his parents and clings to his wife and they become one flesh. So again, we have two and only two types of humans. They are complementary. They express that through marriage and reproduction. And finally, in chapter three, verse 16, the Lord God in this passage says to the woman, your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. And hence, uh, we add to the picture uh, what traditionally has been called patriarchy, rule by the fathers. Although in a way, I think uh, a term that biblical scholar Elizabeth Schussler Fiorenza uses is uh, really even more explanatory, kyriarchy, rule by the kyrios, which in Greek, can basically refer to any man in authority over another. So a Kyrios can be an emperor, it can be the master of a slave, the father of a household, or the husband of a wife. All use this same term. And in conservative Christian Bible reading, as I say, for many, this is where you can stop and say, the Bible said it, I believe it, that settles it, here it is. God's plan for creation is uh, two genders or two sexes, and those two get conflated, that are complementary to each other, where the fullest expression of that complementarity is marriage and the bearing of children, and in which uh, men rule over women. So, that's a reading you can find out there a lot. Uh, many will argue it's traditional. That's always arguable, just how traditional uh, many modern conservative readings are. Um, but there it is. And we have spent, uh, many of us, uh, you know, we've spent in, in scholarship and in the church, um, you know, over half a century already uh, trying to dismantle. Um, that reading, trying to open up what seems so given in Genesis 1 through 3. And so my first nod, of course, would be to feminist activism and scholarship. As feminists pressed for greater gender equity, for equal opportunity, um, as activists theorized what they were doing, Right? They began first and foremost to try to separate out a biological sex. You know, bodies come in different varieties, and that is biological, from a socially constructed gender and socially constructed gender roles. So this would be part of that biology is not destiny, that kind of thrust of, of feminist activism and scholarship. In terms of biblical scholarship, that took a couple of different forms. So one was reclaiming uh, women in the Bible who do not conform to gender roles. So first trying to understand what were the gender roles in the ancient world and who were the women who uh, exceeded those gender roles, who couldn't be contained by those gender roles. And so attention focused on figures like uh, the prophet Miriam, the sister of Aaron and Moses. She's called a prophet in Exodus chapter 15, verse 20. Uh, the figure of Deborah in Judges chapter 4, verse 5. She's both called a prophetess and a judge of Israel in this book of Judges. Uh, Jael, the, also in Judges chapter 5, 
uh, called the most blessed of women uh, after she has killed uh, the enemy general of the people who are identified as oppressing uh, the Israelites. So part of this project was saying, wait a minute, um, while there may be two biological sexes in the Bible, gender is not as cut and dried. There are people who do gender differently in the Bible. Another piece of this was also going back and rereading some of those women characters in the Bible who appeared to be very normatively gendered, but on re-examination could be read quite differently. So for example, Eve from Genesis 2 and 3, who again on the traditional reading is your wife subordinated to her husband, uh, whose role is to be the mother of all living, as the language in Genesis said. But you know, if you go back to Genesis 3, 6, when the serpent speaks to the woman and tells her about this fruit she could eat, she doesn't simply eat it. We're told, actually, that she deliberates within herself. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. So this woman can be read as a seeker of wisdom, which of course is uh, a role assigned to people like Solomon uh, in the wisdom literature of the Bible. But here is the first seeker after wisdom we have in the Bible, uh, namely Eve. So we begin to at least break open the conversation about gender normativity. Growing out of this feminist work, we begin to have those who are involved, who get involved in masculinity studies, both uh, feminist scholars and pro-feminist men getting involved in masculinity studies, trying to um, uncover and promote uh, alternatives to a toxic masculinity, the kind of masculinity associated with domination, with rape culture, with other problematic gender dynamics in society. They begin to argue that although in each society you'll find a dominant masculinity, a hegemonic masculinity, that there are always potentially subversive marginalized masculinities that uh, may be hidden but can be brought to light and may create new directions for being men. And so in terms of biblical scholarship, um, some of the things that began to be explored um, in prophetic literature like the book of Hosea, Israelite men are asked to think of themselves as the wife of God. What does that mean for the masculinity of men if they're to imagine themselves as the wives of the deity. What does that do to a, a biblical notion of masculinity? Or looking at the New Testament and the Greco-Roman culture, where one of the key elements of masculinity was that your body was not violable, it couldn't be violated, and yet at the heart of the Christian message was the violation of the body of Jesus. What does that do to Christian notions of masculinity? So we begin to open up the conversation now from the other side and say, as we see gender diversity among women, can we find gender diversity among men? But as we know today, uh, and as Pastor Laura reminded us, um, the cutting edge around gender diversity tends now to have moved in the direction of activism by those who identify as trans and non-binary, as well as those who identify as intersex. In terms of theory, um, we've, been, we've been challenged to rethink the idea that biology provides only a binary sexual division of human beings, that all human bodies are either male or female. The bodies of the intersex are living proof that bodies come in a much wider uh, spectrum of physical arrangements than those that we have normatively labeled as uh, male and female. And of course, uh, moving away from binary gender to gender as a spectrum, 
and to a more complex idea of gender that connects both to bodies, but also to uh, identities and to the ways one expresses oneself uh, in daily life. And so this is where uh, the work that I've been focused on for many years uh, comes into the picture. Because the work I focused on wanted to move from um, focusing on uh, men and women in the Bible in ways that might be gender transgressive to in fact arguing that there's greater gender diversity in the Bible um, than we have thought previously. So I'll pause at that point um, and ask if there are any questions. And I should say at this point, please feel free to interrupt me at any point um, with questions. You can always use the Zoom, raise hand. You can also just unmute yourself and, and shout out. Uh, let me come back here to a question from Lori. So intersex would be those who are born with an anatomy that in some way, shape or form combines elements of what we would normatively call male and female. Um, once upon a time, uh, intersex persons would have been called hermaphrodites uh, from a Greek myth about a being that was simultaneously male and female. Uh, that term has come to be seen as pejorative uh, and intersex has been the, the chosen uh, term. Um, just to put it in context, because, you know, when I discovered this way back in the early 2000s, this was shocking to me. Um, but the estimate is that that 1% of all births are some uh, type of intersex. So if you start putting in the numbers of how many human beings there are in the world, um, intersex is not nearly as rare uh, as one would probably expect. And so it was partly through learning about intersex, actually, that I was drawn to this figure of eunuchs. They're different. I'm not going to equate the two here. But what I was looking for was, does the Bible, in fact, only recognize men and women? Is that the sum total of humanity that is, is made visible in the Bible? And so I started studying about eunuchs. Um, eunuchs were, in antiquity, um, people who were uh, typically born with um, normative, normative anatomy identified as male but who either were born without functioning uh, testicles and therefore were not able uh, to father children or who were actually made to have non-functioning testicles uh, through castration. It turns out that in the ancient world, um, it was very common in the royal courts to take certain slaves and to castrate them and therefore to be able to use them as people who could move between um, what was normatively masculine space and normatively feminine space without a fear that these uh, slaves of the king would impregnate uh, the king's uh, women. And so these uh, come to be called court eunuchs and they were widespread not only throughout the biblical world um, but also China and, and other parts of the world and some of you may have heard of them continuing on up into the Middle Ages in the form of singers uh, in the, at the Vatican, as well as ultimately the world of opera. Um, the, the last opera eunuch lived long enough to actually have their voice recorded in the early 20th century. So we have one recording of the voice of somebody who was castrated before puberty to preserve a certain kind of singing voice that was unique uh, to Unix. And Unix who were castrated before puberty, which was the typical case for court Unix, had other physical characteristics that put their bodies on a different place on the, the spectrum of human bodies. While they retained certain characteristics that were normatively male, 
They also developed characteristics that were norm normatively female. Uh, they tended to collect uh, fat in, in their breasts and in their backsides in patterns that were much more common to female bodies than male bodies. Uh, they tended to lose musculature. And yet also they had some features that were unique to eunuchs. And so we're told that their skin um, was very thin and very wrinkled from an early age. So these were bodies that were not male, they were not female, they were not simply combinations of male and female, they were some sort of unique body um, that, is, uh, that is different from, from others. Now here's the thing, um, one probably wouldn't know, but in fact the Bible is full of eunuchs. And so I want to start by talking about the hidden eunuchs of the Bible. The fact is, just taking the Hebrew Bible, the word eunuch is used 45 times in the Hebrew Bible. 45 times there are characters referred to as eunuchs. However, if you read the NRSV version of the Bible, the New Revised Standard Version, you'd only find that word 21 times out of the 45. If you read the New International Version, you'd only find it 14 times out of the 45. And if you read the Contemporary English Version, you would find it zero times out of the 45. So there are eunuchs in the Bible who have been hidden from view. A big part of that has been because scholars have not wanted to admit that the courts, the royal courts of Israel and Judah employed eunuchs just like the royal courts of uh, the surrounding peoples, just like the quote unquote pagan royal courts, the royal courts of Israel and Judah employed uh, eunuchs. But there tends to be a rule among translators, an unspoken rule, that you only translate the Hebrew word for eunuch as eunuch if it applies to foreign people. But the moment the word is used for people in Israel and Judah, you instead translate it as an official. And you, you leave aside the entire question of castration and of bodily uh, configuration. So for example, in 2 Kings chapter 20, verses 16 through 18, um, when Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, is talking to the king Hezekiah about the future uh, exile to Babylon, among other things, he says to the king that in those days, some of your own sons who were born to you shall be taken away. They shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. So here, because it's the king of Babylon, right, it's okay to say they're going to be eunuchs, but of course, this is also one of these oracles of judgment from the prophets. And so in this case, isn't this horrible that your sons are gonna be taken and castrated by these foreigners to serve in their royal courts? However, in 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 11 and 15, when the people have asked for a king, and in a very negative section, uh, Samuel is telling them what a king is going to be like, he says, among other things, these will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take one-tenth of your grain and of your vineyards and give it to his officers and his courtiers. Now, officers and courtiers, that sounds really nice, doesn't it? Um, but in fact, what he really says is um, he'll give it to his eunuchs and his slaves. So, so here we have um, an assumption that just like other royal courts, the royal court that the people are asking for in Israel um, will include eunuchs and, and will include slaves. Finally, I want to turn to some really prominent eunuchs in the Bible, the first of whom is found in Jeremiah chapter 38. Uh, you may remember Jeremiah as the woe is me prophet. And this is one of his woe is me times. He's been um, sort of arrested and thrown in a cistern and he's gonna be left there to starve to death. And we're told that at that point, Evid Melech, which is an interesting name, it really just means a slave of the king, um, 
Evid Melik the Ethiopian, a eunuch in the king's house. So he hears that they put Jeremiah into the cistern and he goes to the king and says that this is a wicked thing and that he should be released. And the king allows Ebed Melik, the Ethiopian eunuch, to release Jeremiah from his imprisonment uh, in the cistern. That interestingly dovetails with another prominent eunuch who is also Ethiopian in the New Testament in the book of Acts, chapter 8, verses 26 through 40. Um, this is what I wrote my book on, uh, wrote my dissertation on. Here, this uh, Ethiopian eunuch has been to Jerusalem to worship, which is ironic itself because he probably would not have been allowed to worship in the temple because uh, the law uh, in Deuteronomy 23.1 um, says that those uh, who have uh, mutilated genitalia uh, are, are not allowed to do that kind of worship. However, um, he is a faithful reader of the scripture and so on his way back to Ethiopia, he is reading uh, from the prophet Isaiah, and the Spirit brings Philip the evangelist to join him in his chariot uh, as he is reading about uh, this figure in Isaiah uh, that we sometimes refer to as the suffering servant. Uh, he asks who this figure is. Philip proclaims that this figure is Jesus and tells him the good news of Jesus. And then the eunuch, the Ethiopian eunuch, takes the initiative when he sees water and in almost a challenging way to the evangelist says, here's water, what's to prevent me from being baptized? And in fact, uh, Philip says nothing. <laughs> There's nothing to prevent this uh, differently gendered person um, from being baptized. And so in fact, he becomes the first to be baptized who is not clearly Jewish or a convert to Judaism. Finally, eunuchs come up again in the Gospel of Matthew in a most interesting way in chapter 19, verses 9 through 12. I'm going to read these to you in, in their entirety here. So Jesus is speaking to his disciples. And I say to you, Whoever divorces his wife except for unchastity and marries another commits adultery. His disciples said to him, If such is the case of a man with his wife, it is better not to marry. But he said to them, Not everyone can accept this teaching, but only those to whom it is given. For there are eunuchs who have been so from birth, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by others, and there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Let anyone accept this who can. And Christians have debated for centuries, what was Jesus talking about? Somehow we got from divorce and remarriage to talking about eunuchs. Jesus recognizes that there are eunuchs, there are men who have been born without the ability to reproduce. He refers to the court eunuchs, those who had been made eunuchs by others. He also refers to figures that would have been familiar in the first century, who were devotees of a particular goddess who castrated themselves as a form of devotion to that goddess. So Jesus presents these three categories of eunuchs, and lo and behold, we know from the history of early Christianity that at least some people took Jesus very literally. And like those devotees of the goddess Sibylle, uh, these men castrated themselves to the glory of God. Uh, however, as you might imagine, that didn't become the most popular reading in Christianity. So ultimately that third category came to be read metaphorically as, uh, as a, a stand-in for uh, sexual renunciation, for asceticism. Uh, this became a mandate for monks and others um, to, to not marry for the sake of the kingdom of God. I want to suggest to you today that what could be most interesting about this passage is that Jesus is in some way, shape, or form asking himself, asking his disciples to put themselves in the position of eunuchs in their world. 
And what would that mean? What would that mean for, for these disciples who uh, presumably see themselves as men, uh, both anatomically and in terms of their gender roles? Um, they may not have grown up as elites, but they certainly see themselves at, by the time we're, we're talking here as leaders of some sort in this Christian community. What would it mean for them to somehow be in the world as eunuchs? Figures who combined both power, because they worked for royal courts, but with marginalization. They were cut off from their natal, from their families of birth. They were cut off from any future family since they were unable to reproduce. They were slaves whose value was increased by being forcibly circumcised. They were despised by other people to a great extent because they messed up their ideas of what human beings were. They either combined male and female or they were neither male and female, which would make them not human. Some called them monsters. In fact, in some ways it was even harder because men had to put up with these despised monsters being able to exercise royal power. So theirs was not an enviable position per se in the ancient world and somehow Jesus wants his disciples to see themselves as eunuchs, to somehow live in the world as eunuchs. What, what would that mean? Questions. I've, I've taken you on a quick little journey through biblical scholarship and gender diversity. Other questions at this stage? Uh, so yes, uh, Michael's asking about, I, I mentioned there were some early Christians who took this quite literally. Uh, the most famous of them is Origen, who was an early uh, theologian. Um, we can't know for sure, but the claim is uh, that he had uh, castrated himself in response to this, this, uh, this notion from Jesus. Um, I will say, you may know the old saw about, you know, you don't make rules unless somebody's already broken some of them, right? You don't make a rule not to walk on the grass unless people are already walking on the grass. Um, it, it's interesting, the, the Council of Nicaea, very early, one of these early ecumenical gatherings of bishops that we know mostly for the creed that it produced, the Nicene Creed, Actually, the first rule in the canons, in the church law, that this council produced was a rule against ordaining castrated persons as priests. So it was common enough that in the fourth century, bishops thought they had to make a rule against it. And some of you may have heard the story over the years that uh, at least once upon a time, although nobody will admit whether it still happens, that uh, someone elected to be the next pope had to sit in a very special chair. Have any of you heard this story? Had to sit in a very special chair with a hole in the middle of it while someone checked to make sure he was anatomically qualified uh, to be the bishop. Now, one version of the story you may have heard about uh, the, the legend of Pope Joan. So, of course, an early assumption about this chair was that it was to make sure he was a man and not a woman. Um, but I, in fact, think, given everything that we know, it was actually to make sure that he was uh, anatomically intact and had not been castrated in line with this rule from the Nicene uh, Council. So there are three questions I would like to pose to you for discussion. Uh, and so the first question, what does Jesus's call for the disciples to make themselves eunuchs for the kingdom, sake of the kingdom of heaven mean to you? What does it mean to you, this call from Jesus for disciples to make themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven? Second question, what does the presence of gender diversity in the Bible mean for the way Christians engage with gender diversity today? 
So what does the presence of gender diversity back then in the Bible mean for the way Christians engage with gender diversity today? And finally, what actions might First Congregational Church take in light of what you've learned today? What actions might First Congregational Church take in light of what you've learned? <laughs>